thank, thank you, thank you. I um, want to thank uh, Sid for the invitation and, uh, and Tom for the uh, introduction. Um, we especially appreciate the weather you have arranged. <laughs> Just enough so that I get to see a, snowflake, a few snowflakes and uh, the remnant of the uh, foliage. Uh, maybe to you it's not much, but to, you know, to those from Southern California, it's uh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Two of these things so we we'll, we'll really miss. Um, okay, so I would like to share with you today um, uh, the uh, sort of, uh, I'll say, my, my experience as a theoretical physicist doing experimental biology. Right? Uh, bio, well, you see where the physics comes in. Well, I'll say most non-physicists will not recognize what, what we're doing uh, uh, as a physics, except for physicists that we're seeing. <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> So I do not know uh, how much exposure uh, this department uh, has to uh, do with, uh, uh, with the biology, uh, but so I would like to start with uh, uh, what people say how the 21st century is the century of uh, biology, right? It's like, oh, we are like a part say, right? <laughs> 21st century, the biology. Um, so I would like to start with a historical perspective uh, what it means to be a century of something, right? So if we think back to two centuries ago, beginning of 1800s, the, the Industrial Revolution, right? I, I don't know, the century of, uh, what do you call it? <laughs> uh, industry chemistry, right? So you will have images of, uh, I don't know, uh, chimneys, uh, windmill chimneys, uh, steamboats, right? Steam engines are going um, all the way to uh, rockets, uh, in this century. Um, so if you think about it, what is it that allowed this really exponential increase right, of, uh, of uh, our ability to, to move around, to ma manipulate the environment? Um, well, I would say that uh, it's really it, it, uh, traced back to one trick that scientists have figured out, okay? And that is how to convert chemical energy uh, to work. Um, now, there's a, a trick we figured out, of course, and there are several other elements that go with it, and that is that you need to have some technology and uh, uh, materials and, uh, and engines, right, and foundation, scientific foundation, of course, thermodynamics, physical mechanics. Um, okay, so that was the 1800s. Now, if we forward, fast forward 100 years to the 19th century, right, so that's the century that gives us, uh, well, most of us live through it, um, uh, transistor, the integrated circuits, and all that, right? So if you think about that revolution there, um, so what underlies all of that, right? Well, I would say, again, scientists have figured out one trick, right? And the trick is, uh, right, we know how to describe and control electrons. Um, to do that, of course, uh, to, to enable all of this, uh, uh, <coughs> this uh, power, of course, is a, a technology, integrated circuit, manufacturing, materials, all that, and the uh, scientific foundation uh, is quantum mechanics, information theory. Um, so now we're in the 21st century, okay, and uh, uh, everybody has probably read uh, in, the, in the news uh, media about how you know, biofuels, uh, how, to, how to clean up, uh, how we can use the bacteria to clean up uh, waste, um, <coughs> personalized medicine, many, many things to do with biology, right? Um, so this could happen just by tr trial and error, but if the last two centuries are a guide, maybe there's also, if we're gonna, for this to happen, right now there's still science fiction, right? But if we're gonna really make these dream come true, then I would, uh, uh, hope there's also some fundamental lessons that you know, we, we, we will learn from nature, okay? And now I have no idea what, what will be the, uh, the ones here that corresponding to, to, to these guys, okay? Uh, but think in order, but, but then in order to realize dreams, I think we will have to be able to make quantitative predictive statements of a living system, right? <coughs> and, uh, uh, so what about technology and the scientific foundations? I would not uh, bear to uh, guess, uh, really, right? The, uh, the, but then, well, I would say, 
you know, the word thermodynamics, so right now it's a 2019, I don't know, in 1819, I, I don't think the word thermodynamics has been invented, right? So you need to kind of the, figure out what you're dealing with before you can go back and call it, uh, give it some name. Okay. Um, now, we can, but this could just be a dream. Maybe there's uh, nothing interesting in biology. No, just, just a whole bunch of details to, to, to figure out, right? Um, so we can ask, in retrospect, uh, should we be surprised that there's some fundamental lessons out of uh, these two revolutions, right? And uh, of course, we know that uh, in the world of quantum mechanics, uh, the, in, in retrospect, we, we should not be surprised that our intuition about how tennis balls go around should not be applied to describe electrons. So there could be something different, right? And we can gain something from learning about the world of very small. And uh, uh, thermodynamics, yes, well, we all know there's a law of large numbers that ultimately is up there, right? So there's something special about these systems, right? But so can we think of something that's also special of the biological system, that the understanding of which right, may, may lead to sort of a new way of thinking about uh, uh, nature? Uh, well, I'm gonna say yes, and, uh, and the one thing is that for anybody that study biology, the one very striking lesson immediately confronts with is the heterogeneity, okay? And by so heterogeneity in the sense of, uh, you know, you open, you open up your body, you open up the living cells, there's, there's so many different components, right? And they're not random, okay? So I, I used to do spin glass, and uh, fine, they have lots of uh, 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 different interactions, but you take, a, you can take some Gaussian distribution, then it becomes simple again, right? So you can do something about it. But these things, uh, or so the biologists in the past, would, you know, each lab was spent 20, 30 years just studying this one, one of these things, right? And then there are many, many, many. Okay, so we, uh, if I go back to physics repertoire and mathematics, we have no experience dealing with this type of thing, right? So maybe there's a lesson to be in there. Um, so I work in uh, microbiology. So look at the bacteria, the growth of the bacteria, okay? And so I want to uh, give uh, a introduction to the complexity in, in, the, in this uh, bacterial world. And it also uh, gives me a chance to set up uh, some of the concepts that will be needed. Okay. So bacteria, so this is a static picture of a bacteria, uh, micrometers in size, micrometers in, in diameter, maybe a few micrometers in length, right? Um, so if you take a few bacteria and put it in uh, some medium, simple medium with glucose, ammonia, a few trace metals, and uh, it, it will, after some waiting time, it will start growing exponentially, right? And uh, until at some point, uh, some components of the elements is exhausted, then it reaches what's called a stationary phase. They just stop growing. They, they don't die, they're just kind of hanging there, okay? When you put them back, New nutrients, they can start growing again. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's think about, okay, what, so, so a key number uh, in this, uh, the, the describing uh, the system is just exponent the rate of exponential growth, right? Here I call it lambda. Well, this growth rate is a function of many, many, many factors. Right? It's affected by many, many factors, for example, environment, right? You change temperature, it's gonna change. You change the osmolarity, you put in, dumping lots of salt, it's gonna change. You change the type of nutrient, instead of glucose, you give it some uh, glycerol, whatever, then it's gonna change. Um, it also depends on uh, what's inside of the cell. You knock out a few genes, that's gonna change. Maybe it will not even grow. Right? If it grows, it grows with a different rate. Um, <coughs> so, the understanding of even this very simple, what biologists would call vegetative growth space of the system would require understanding of uh, how uh, this growth rate is determined by all of these factors. So let's think about what it takes for a cell to, one cell to become two cells, right? So this is what, what goes into uh, this growth rate. Well, if we open up a bacterium cell, see that, okay, it's got cell wall, it's got some uh, tail flagella that makes it swim, uh, DNA, a bunch of proteins. If you do a chemical analysis, it's, well, two-thirds of it is water. This is actually quite conserved for, for, for many living states. Uh, One-third matter, 
with the water. And among the biomass, if you open it up, then actually the majority of the protein, about two thirds of the protein, of the remainder, another half to two thirds of RNA. Okay, and then DNA is actually a very small, a few percent. All right, so, so for a cell to double, it needs to make all of that stuff, right, within the, as, as short as the 20 minutes, make all of that stuff, okay? So, uh, and this is the process I want to guide you uh, through in, in this hour, all right? So let's, let's uh, focus on RNA and the protein, okay, the two major uh, components. Well, proteins are polymers of the 20 amino acids that's uh, stitched together. And this polymer, this polymerization process uh, occurs uh, uh, through a machine called the ribosome. Okay, ribosome stitches amino acids together and uh, spits out this uh, polypeptide chain, eventually folded into some form. <coughs> this ribosome is made of uh, two components, RNA and a protein. All right? And in fact, most of the RNA you will measure in a living cell uh, is uh, uh, this uh, RNA for the ribosome. Okay, this is true. Uh, for bacteria especially, and even for our cells that open up, most of the RNAs are this ones that's in the ribosome. <coughs> um, the, then there's the, the remainder of the RNA, so there's a, a special adapter molecules called tRNA, and it does the job of matching the triplet codon that's encoded in a message, the mRNA, uh, which is the, what uh, the, the ribosome reads. And uh, for each triplet, it matches to a amino acid, one of the 20 amino acids. There are for 64 triplets, and most of them, except for three of them, they're called stop, they code for some amino acid. And so there the are 60 some species of tRNA that does the matching. Okay? So the way uh, the system works is this. So, so here we have a ribosome in the middle of a reading this transcript and turning into a uh, protein, a uh, polypeptide chain. All right? So, it is uh, at the step, and it's waiting for the next triplet to come. And so, okay, so uh, switch to a, a, this is more like a 3D structure of this uh, tRNA. So anyway, it's an amino acid associated with this uh, tRNA. And uh, so the right, if the right one comes in, then it will go into this uh, site called A site, acceptance site. And then uh, through an energy uh, step that requires energy, then this uh, machine moves forward and uh, the, uh, the polypeptide bond is made, and then it returns back to the source. Okay, so it's just a step-by-step step it makes this uh, change. So this itself may be straightforward. Well, until you think about, to, so somebody has to make this, put this amino acid together with the tRNA, okay? And there are 20 amino acids, 60 uh, different types of uh, tRNA, okay? That, that I have to do the matching. And this is done by a set of proteins called a tRNA synthase, right, whose job is to put the right amino acid on the right tRNA. All right, and uh, so these reactions you can characterize uh, in the test tubes, and people have done that. And usually, uh, so, so J here is the flux, the, the, the reaction uh, flux uh, through this system, as uh, depending on the concentration of amino acid, concentration of the uh, tRNA species, right? And and this is a rather vanilla type sort of biochemical uh, uh, expression of the described biochemical uh, rate, okay? The only thing is that one of them is uh, not surprising, I mean, it's, one can easily handle, but there are you know, many of these things, okay? So if you count up the variables, there are order of 100 variables, and each of these uh, functions has a number of parameters, we're talking about a couple hundred parameters. Okay, now the next thing is, well, where do these amino acids come from? If I start from uh, glucose or start from ammonia, somebody has to make them, right? And um, <clears throat> so there are various uh, pathways, each requiring enzymes to stitch, the, uh, to basically manipulate the carbon backbone or the uh, nitrogen to put it together to make amino acids, right? And the 20 amino acid, and there are many, many of these pathways to make this 20. So, couple hundred enzymes that are involved, each will, and, and also a couple hundred small molecules that's needed uh, as an intermediate. So we're talking about many more parameters, right? And uh, on top of that, there's a regulation. That is, uh, you, want to, you, don't, you want to make just enough enzymes as needed 
for your situation. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a kind of control uh, processes to, to decide how much uh, of each enzyme to make. So that's more uh, parameters. Now, and on top of all of that, all right, so, so now we have uh, more, okay? But this is a static picture, maybe say at 37 degree in one condition. Of course, when I change all these external parameters, all of these parameters change, right? They all have temperature dependence. They have dependence on pH, on this and that, okay? And additionally, if we want to understand something about evolution, these enzymes, could, the, the residue can be mutated and it will have different uh, properties, right? So, so we're, we're talking about many, many more parameters, okay? A very conservative estimate will give you something like a million parameters. On top of that, well, this is the simplest bacterium, right? We're really interested in something uh, more complicated, more related to us, right? And we're talking about, okay, oops, we're talking about, well, more may be an exaggeration, but we're talking about really astronomical number of uh, parameters, okay? And so maybe that was, so the statistical physics part of me, I'm happy when we talk about so many parameters, right? So the breakthrough in statistical mechanics, when some number becomes very large, you say, okay, qualitatively, maybe a new kind of phenomena uh, comes in. Okay, but at least um, <coughs> there's difficulty here. All right, so, oops, uh, sorry, I, I, okay, let me just file fast forward to this. So now, this is a physics audience, right? Physics student should be able to look at this and say, oh, I have experience w dealing with problem with many, many parameters. Right? All, of, all of us, like, even undergraduates, and undergraduate, any undergraduates here? Which year? Huh? Second, okay. okay. The, or maybe second you already encountered this, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a problem right, in, in physics that involves a, a mode of parameters and we're able to handle it, no problem. All right, what's the problem? Okay, so if we were to describe gas molecules in this room, right, and we start from a Newtonian description, well, we need modes of parameters. You can, otherwise, you cannot even get started. Right? <coughs> need modes of parameters, but of course, we know there's a better way, uh, well, a more, uh, it's a simpler way to describe it, thermodynamics, ideal gas law being an example. So, someone, sort of a, a, a big data person or information person look at this and say, ah, there's a tremendous degree of a dimension reduction happening in this system, right? We're talking about some problem in principle that depends on many, many parameters. Eventually, there's something very simple that they emerge. So where does this data uh, dimension reduction come from? Maybe if we have a lesson here, maybe we can also try to apply it to the other systems. Well, thing is, you just cannot go from Newtonian mechanics to thermodynamics, right? Mr. Boltzmann tried to do that, and he committed suicide. <laughs> and we still don't know. <laughs> Every time I teach this, I have to tell them we cannot do this. Okay, you, you can do your best, Kind of, we have to make a leap of faith at some point. All right. So, very fortunately, actually, thermodynamics is de developed as a separate field, independent of uh, mechanics, mechanics, right? Because uh, people didn't know gas were made of molecules, right? So it was developed for its own sake. Okay. And then statistical mechanics, right? So then Boltzmann uh, statistical mechanics is a way to link these two together. Um, at an operational level, what is this for mechanics? Right? Well, it is, so, so well, suppose we have a Newtonian uh, system, and the, now there's a, a huge computer. You can, in principle, plug in random initial condition, try different initial conditions, and crank your computer, and you can, you can measure your pressure and volume and so forth, and, and discover the ideal gas. Right? But of course, what the civil mechanics provide for you is a shortcut. Right? You don't have to go through all of the dynamics. You can say, make a statement, about, well, talking about equilibrium statistical mechanics, you can make a statement about the equilibrium state without going through the dynamics. And if we know such trick for biology, that'd be very useful, okay? We know a lot about molecular stuff. We can say something about 
the steady state of the event. <coughs> All right? So what is the trick here that allowed one to do this shortcut? Well, I would say the trick is ultimately something about Hamiltonian dynamics, okay? These particles are described by, the, 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 the motions are just specified by, by the Hamiltonian, right? And uh, uh, the, uh, the density function, which describes the all possible uh, arrangement of all of the particles and momentum, is, is uh, well, depending on these uh, uh, microscopic variables through a scalar function, which we, is a Hamiltonian, right? So this can be very complicated, but then this relation itself is simple. Okay? I'm not going into the details. Just knowing that relation, you can already use it to derive many thermodynamic relations. Okay. <coughs> this is dependent. Yeah. All right? So now we have a problem of understanding biological physics. On this side, we also, uh, many decades of molecular biology has, oh, okay, so first of all, uh, so, I, 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 well, our lab, we only study this uh, simple cell, right? But still, as I just said before, it's very, very complicated as a molecular chemist, right? We know a lot about molecular interaction. Not, well, I describe the ribosomes, but, but then we know a lot of, uh, <coughs> for, for a few model bacteria, we really know a lot about molecular interaction, right? And we want to make a bridge and then talk about sort of a microscopic uh, <coughs> properties. Physiology. The problem is these days, uh, the last 40, 50 years of uh, uh, biology, mostly focused on molecular systems, okay? And uh, this is, uh, people have learned so much from molecular uh, system, there's a less and less attention paid to large scale phenomena, which is the word is physiology. And so basically, what, then what, when, when, um, when we got into the, uh, uh, this, uh, in, in the middle of this action, we realized that there's very little that's known about the microscopic, on the microscopic end. Okay, so we, uh, our lab, so we started a wet lab, and uh, we started basically characterizing uh, the physiology. At the, we're doing quantitative phys phenomenology, basically. Okay? <clears throat> and uh, so then these, finally the last uh, uh, a few years we started to try to make link between these two, right? And we call this uh, quantitative uh, system biology. The word doesn't matter, right? <coughs> but we're trying to relate the molecules to the phenomenology at the large scale. And uh, similar to this uh, trick pointed out uh, in the uh, equivalence to home mechanics, uh, so here's a punchline that was in the system I'll be describing to you. Uh, there's a control function that's central that determines the cell growth. And it is, in principle, dependent on many, many, many variables, okay? But it actually, the cell played a trick so that the dependence is through a single variable. As a result, many, many things simplify, okay? And uh, a meta message uh, is, uh, is uh, this. The, so things are very complicated. It looks to us very complicated, right? And uh, the biologists, the ones that I have interacted with mostly have been kind of uh, learned to accept this complexity. So, well, it's complicated, but evolution has figured it out. Okay, so the parameters are being finely tuned or whatever, so, so things, just, things work out. Okay, uh, but I guess uh, we are coming with a slightly different attitude, say that, well, you know, evolution fine has, it, 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 it's not omnipotent, and there are things that that's also, if it's hard for us, maybe it's also hard for the cell, right? The cell needs to find some simple way, okay? And this is actually a trick the cell can do to handle the complexity for it, right? This is because, of the, as you will see, these, uh, for, for these cells to survive, it needs to respond in a reasonable way to a lot of perturbations, right? And if it, everything depends on anything, how is it gonna do that? So there needs to be trick, right? And uh, basically, it's only when a system has some uh, interesting uh, tricks that then there's a job for us biologists, physicists to do, try to understand the tricks of the life. <coughs> okay, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the overall setting of uh, uh, our lab's uh, uh, approach to studying biological systems. So now, <laughs> uh, just uh, as an example, so 
what one can learn, uh, what we can gain from this type of, uh, of understanding this kind of trip, uh, tricks is that, well, then we can make quantitative prediction, so, so uh, describing changes. So, so here is a system, so the vertical axis, just look at the black symbols for now, describe the density of cells. So it's, it's, it's a semi-log plot, so cells are growing exponentially. At some point, some nutrient runs out. Okay, so it's, it has to switch from a, a good nutrient to a poor nutrient. Then as a result, uh, the, the, the rate of replication slows down. Eventually, there's some adaptation, and it picks up again. Right? And the, the other colors are basically other internal variables of the cell. But the black is, the, uh, is uh, just the cell number. Cell density. Okay? And uh, so I'll be describing, so ba just based on this uh, very simple uh, recognition, I mean, this, the, recognizing this uh, simple dependence, uh, we, we can de develop a uh, simple ODE that describes, so, so the black line is the result of the model. The model has no fitting parameter. So what you tell it is the initial condition, that's how, where you're growing, and the, the final condition where you're going to. Okay, and then the model predicts how the cell makes this transition. You can turn things around. You start with a poor medium and going to a better medium. Everything's the same. So all you do is invert the initial and the final condition, right? And then the same model describes uh, these new lines, which is data for them. Okay. So we are, we are able to now. Admittedly, this is a very simple kind of a perturbation, but at least for these simple changes, just by recognizing uh, the structure, we're able to make predictive models of the behavior. <clears throat> so, uh, now let me start uh, telling you about uh, details of this uh, system. Um, in the, starting from the late 50s uh, through the 60s and 70s, um, at that time, biologists did not have a whole lot of things to measure. So they were looking at the microscopic quantities, so the total RNA in the cell, total protein in the cell. And uh, the, this wonderful uh, result of coming out of the lab of uh, Oli Moller, uh, who is uh, 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 in Copenhagen. Uh, those of you who have been to Niels Bohr Institute uh, in Copenhagen, um, okay, so actually uh, there's a street, I think it's right, right next to Niels Bohr Institute. It's called uh, uh, the Oli Moller Way. Okay, so, so, so he's very uh, connected to, to, to <coughs> the physics at that time. Um, so, they were looking at a, a very simple relation. So they measured the total RNA uh, in a culture. So you grow exponentially. Okay, so every one of these data points is a, a culture of bacteria growing exponentially. Okay, so you feed the bacteria with some medium. Okay, then it grow at some rate. Okay, so let's focus on this point. That, that's one uh, kind of food that, uh, that the bacteria grow with this rate. Then you harvest the bacteria, you measure total RNA, you measure total protein, you take the ratio. So you get this one point, right? Now you change the medium, you make a measurement. You change the medium, you make a measurement. And now you see that's a striking behavior. It's a simple linear relation. Why is a simple relation uh, interesting? Because usually, if you measure something in biology, any uh, component, you get some kind of a nonlinear hill curve, okay? Which is you know, really not surprising at all. I mean, it just, just means some random, some interaction. But it's very rare you see something simple. This is very simple. <coughs> uh, so this is a, a, a gross, a gross rate of this x-axis changed by changing different carbon sources. So <coughs> what does it mean? So RNA, as I told you, is basically representing the ribosome, because most of RNA is in the ribosome. And the per total protein, protein is basically a measure of how big the cell, cell size is, because the biomass is mostly a protein, because it's proportional to the cell volume. So this is a, a proxy for ribosome concentration. Okay, so faster cell grows, more ribosome. Now, molar, at that time, you know, they think a lot about the data. There's not that many data points, so they can think about it, right? And um, uh, so came up with a nice way to understand, rationalize uh, this linear relation. So it says, okay, so suppose, um, <coughs> okay, so you have ribosome making protein. All of the proteins are made by ribosome, okay? Suppose the uh, uh, proteins are stable, that they don't uh, 
uh, get degraded, which is true uh, for these uh, fast growing bacteria, then the rate of a total protein production should just be given by the rate of how fast the ribosomes are working. Okay, so, so if all the ribosomes are working at full speed, faster you grow, the more ribosome you need to have to make sure. Okay? And if you relate this, you, you equate these two quantities, so this is a, a exponential growth, so the rate of increase is just growth rate multiplied by the total mass, the protein mass, right? And this is a gamma is a how fast the ribosome elongating. Uh, this is the mass of ribosome, uh, which is related to the number of ribosomes, since we know everything about <coughs> the, uh, how big the ribosome is. So you equate these two, you take the ratio, you see that the fraction, the, what it says is the fraction of a, a, a ribosome of a total protein uh, is the linear proportional growth rate, which is basically what this is saying. Okay, so this, this is a statement <coughs> that all the ribosomes are busily uh, making things. Um, when we first encounter this relation, so first of all, I would say most biology students do not know about this these days. It's not taught in textbook, okay? And uh, we really uh, uh, encounter this by, by uh, serendipitously. Okay. Um, and when we first encountered it, we, well, it's a nice rationalization, but we were not sure. So we did some experiments to test this. And the sort of obvious type of experiment to do is that we look at mutants which have different uh, rate of a, uh, well, ribosome is working at a slower rate. So if this picture is true, then we will still get linear relation, but with different slope. And we get exactly what this uh, model uh, predicted. Okay, so we, we start to believe in uh, this and start to think about it. <coughs> right, so that, yeah, basically the thing is that all of the ribosome are engaging uh, translation. But this initial relation was discovered in the early 1960s. It sat there for you know, so many years, 50, 50 years. We started working on this uh, in the, around 2010. Right? So we were, we were puzzled by why sort of a, it's such a beautiful relation, why nothing more is done about it. Well, partly uh, biology sort of, uh, people start to uh, discover very interesting you can do. Molecular biology really took off, and there's a lot of many other things we can do, so, so they're not relying on this anymore. Um, but scientifically, when we thought about it, and realized actually this is, it is, uh, this relation is one relation, but it is missing a companion. Okay, so what I mean is this. So in this picture that describes the molar's picture of describing how growth is a control, so growth is growth rate is determined by the fraction of a ribosome, there are two factors that controls growth. One is uh, what, what is, uh, uh, is it being changed, it's the nutrient. Okay, nutrient changes growth. And so that's an implicit variable that drives this relation. The other one is the how fast the ribosome works. Okay, so this is basically, this experiment is done with for a fixed ribosome, how, how, how fast, is this variable fixed, and you're changing this one. So uh, with a, a, a background from Cisco Mechanics, then we, we said, oh, let's ask for the orthogonal question about if we fix the other variable, say nutrient, and we vary uh, this, this variable elongation, well, what would happen, right? <coughs> so like temperature and the magnetic field is two variables uh, to, to understand, uh, say, the, the magnetic system. Okay. Um, all right, so we did the experiment. So I'll uh, set the uh, orthogonal perturbation, and we fix the nutrient, and the very, this elongation of just by applying a drug. Okay, so many drugs that interfere with translation. And lo and behold, we saw another simple relation, another statement. And we can, we can start from a different nutrient that starts from here, and if we apply the drug, then it will go like this. We start another one, it will go like this. Okay. And this is happening not just for ribosomes. And we then look at some other enzymes. So in this experiment, we're looking at a enzyme E. coli uses to take up certain uh, sugars from the environment. Okay. When we limit by carbon, it increases inversely linearly. But then if we do the same thing, we fix the nutrient and we inhibit the cell growth by applying a drug, growth rate slow down, and the enzyme amount slows down linearly. 
Okay, so pretty soon you can put this together, you can start to make predictions. Okay, and uh, the footage will be right now. So looking at this and the many uh, other data of this kind, then we were able to summarize it into a very simple picture. Okay. So we imagine all of the proteins in a cell so it's called that a pie, uh, the full circle, right? And a fraction of this pie is related uh, are enzymes that's needed for translation, that is uh, the ribosomes. Some fraction of the pies is needed for taking up nutrients, that's the, these uh, C proteins, catab uh, uh, catabolic enzymes. Some enzyme I have not talked about, um, except the very beginning, is needed to make amino acid, to make nucleotides, the, the biosynthesis enzymes. Okay. <coughs> In order to grow fast, you need to make more of these uh, enzymes. So phi here is a fraction of the pi that's devoted to a certain enzyme. Okay. So this relation is basically just describing this line. This, this is the phi r, the fraction of the ribosomal uh, uh, proteins, and faster to grow, the more you need. Okay, and to grow fast, you need to have more uh, catabolic enzymes. That's this relation here. Okay. Similarly for, for this biosynthesis enzyme. Um, in the simplest model, then, then the cell will just have these, say, three departments and add up to one. Okay. But in particular, what we find is that that model does not work. And uh, uh, for reasons we did not quite understand at the time, we need to introduce one Parameter that is a fraction only a fraction of the cells are making proteins that's growth rate dependent. Another fraction is fixed, so you can rationalize this as a, some kind of an overhead, so like uh, uh, say you know, uh, the the government uh, whatever the the, the um, entitlement, right? So no matter how good or bad the economy is, you just have to pay this. Okay, so, and that turns out to be about fifty percent of the protein. Okay, so now, <coughs> so now we have four variables, the, the three fractions and the growth rate, and we have four equations, you can fix everything. Okay. Um, so this model is a uh, very, uh, very simple analogy you, you can remember, that this is what I'm describing here is nothing but three resistors in series. Okay. Uh, so in this analogy, uh, the, the current through the system is, uh, is the growth rate, it's so the flux of of, of a material uh, through it. Uh, the voltage across the resistor is just the amount of uh, proteins that's needed to push the flux, okay? And uh, then you see uh, with this analogy, then each one of these is basically Ohm's law, right? And uh, the coefficient will be the conductance uh, in the electrical system, and uh, the coefficient in the biological system just saying how easy it is, what, 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 how good are my enzymes, so how, for, how how much enzyme I had to make to push a certain flux. <clears throat> and uh, then the total voltage is just the fraction of the proteins devoted to these growth processes. Right? So in this system, there's really, okay, so not only the, the number of parameters, the, the resistance of these values, okay, uh, the, how fast uh, ribosome works, that's a genetic parameter that's just fixed. Uh, the fraction, half of the fraction of the, uh, the, the, the uh, half of the cells is devoted to uh, this uh, entitlement, that's also genetically fixed. So we have these two variables which couples to the external world. Okay, if I change, if I use different kind of carbon, basically I'm just changing these values. That the, the thing is completely fixed. Okay, so this is a theory with no parameter. Well, one parameter that is a 50% that's fixed and, and there's no, no other parameter. Um, <coughs> So in this picture, you might ask, well, how do I understand this inverse linear relation? Okay, so I told you there's a linear relation between growth rate and uh, the fraction uh, to, to take up carbon. Why is there this inverse relation? Well, this relation is obtained when we're changing the carbon source. That is, we're actually changing this uh, parameter. So of course, it will not be linear anymore, All right? So it's, this is like you ask the students uh, to, to to measure the IV characteristic of uh, this uh, system, right? But let's say you change the current by dialing the resistance of this resistor, okay? But you, you can still measure the current through it, you can measure the voltage across it, right? What you get will not be Ohm's law, but the inverse of the negative of the Ohm's law. Okay, that's, that's all there. All right, so with this uh, uh, simple theory, we were able to go back and actually 
revisit many, uh, quite a number of a classic microbiology problems where some of these are puzzles are dating back 50 years, even 100 years, were able to uh, resolve uh, some of these uh, issues. I, I don't have time to go over them, but I'll just show you a few pieces of data that kind of uh, try to validate uh, this picture a little bit. And then I will then go on to look at the, the sort of the trick for how, how does the cell or, uh, organize itself so simply. <clears throat> so one piece of uh, uh, validation of this theory is um, to say, well, if this picture is true, well, I've already used uh, the data to, to specify uh, this uh, Ohm's law, right? But to test this picture, what I can do is change the total voltage and see how the current changes. Um, the total voltage is given by this uh, sort of a, this inner fraction uh, Q. Now, ideally, if I can reduce this fraction to make the cell grow faster, then that's what I want to do, okay? But actually, if you look at the, what goes into this, there are many, many proteins you don't want to touch, okay? And, you, you just, and, and it's just too, too much work to, to change each one of them. So what we did was instead, instead of reducing the Q, we, we increase this Q, okay? We can ask the cell to express some protein it doesn't care about, right? So then, then so that's, that's the basic, as far as this picture is concerned, then all we're doing is we're just increasing this Q, so this is overexpression, overexpression some useless protein, okay? Then this theory will just uh, uh, predict that the overall growth uh, proteins are reduced, that is the voltage, total voltage is reduced, and then uh, there will just be a re linear reduction uh, in the growth rate, right? So if you, so these three lines are the prediction, that each line is okay. In, in, in the absence of perturbation, I, I will have some medium that supports certain growth rate. Okay, these three colors are three different medium. And then as I apply this perturbation, then growth rate will just decline linearly until when my perturbation just eats up the entire uh, proteome, then there's nothing left to do. Right, very simple prediction. And you can test it, very simple to test, right? And so we express some protein, right, and that's the data. Right? So now, of course, you see the lines are not go through the data point because it's not a fit, right? This is a zero parameter uh, prediction of the theory. Right? Saying you can, and, and this, uh, the perturbation is actually huge. We, uh, we, were, we were increasing the we were basic expression up to 25% of the cell, which is it's a useless protein, and still uh, the picture is coherent. Now, this kind of study was actually people were doing already in the late 90s when, when, when the, the power, the power of molecular biology people can start to make sort of a useful pro, protein useful for us, not useful for, for, for bacteria. So for example, people make E. coli, force E. coli to make insulin, right? And so there were studies back then, and so we were able to grab some of those data and make comparisons. Right? And here's a comparison. So this is for one medium, this is a blue point, so, so these data are all for growing on this a typical glucose medium that many studies have done now. And each type of a symbol, different color, is a different type of protein that's being expressed, right? And you see that there's even a reasonable collapse of the data. Right? And these are absolute measurements of how much protein is expressed, how fast it grows. There's no fudge factors, no adjustment, no normalization, or anything. Just measurements that put it on the, the data point, right? So this is one. Instance, right? Maybe some, I mean, this is, admittedly, it's a very simple perturbation, but it's at least some, some, uh, 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 some feeling of uh, what physicists are used to in, in, in universality and so forth is, is happening. All right. <clears throat> then another thing I want to show a bit is um, most of our study, the theory, was developed from looking at a few called a reporter protein. So instead of looking at the entire protein, we just pick a few representatives and follow what they were doing. Uh, but then our biology colleagues uh, challenged us, well, you know, you're making a picture about what the entire cell is doing. You, you need to look at the, all, all of the proteins, okay? And so we did that. Now the technology is developed so that we can uh, do that. <coughs> so we worked together uh, with uh, uh, a colleague uh, down the hall uh, in the Scripps in uh, Research Institute, uh, Jamie Williamson. Uh, their labs does a proteomics, okay? So by looking at the mass spectrometry, uh, they can determine the abundance of uh, many proteins, thousands, uh, over almost 2,000 proteins in, 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 the, in the living cell. And uh, so then, so in, in this kind of picture, each line is the abundance of a protein, 
and then uh, this each row is uh, uh, each column is a condition, right? And uh, so we are in these so we are applying carbon limitation, nitrogen limitation, and translational limitation. And you can do some kind of a simple clustering uh, to easily organize the, this data into several groups. And uh, so this is a group. Uh, that uh, basically responds under carbon limitation. Okay, so green is increased larger than a reference value. The nice thing about mass spectrometry uh, result is that if you have some estimate of the abundance of each protein, then for this entire uh, uh, section of the protein, you can just add up the abundance to get the, 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 uh, the, the total abundance devoted to something. Oh, and by the way, I should say, if you look into the identity of this protein, they all have something to do with uh, bringing transporters, bringing carbons, and things like that. All right? And if you add up uh, these guys, then you get this plot here. Okay, so, so, the red, so the red data here is basically adding up this guy under carbon limitation. Okay? So as, as you apply carbon, carbon limitation, then the amount of a cell uh, proteins devoted to carbon acquisition increases. Uh, and similarly, but then the ones that devoted to acquiring nitrogen, uh, so acquiring, oh, oh, of the same carbons, uh, same enzymes decrease under uh, limitation of nitrogen, limitation of the translation, things like that. All right, you can apply the same thing to ribosomes, and they increase under, uh, uh, when, when translation is inhibited, and they decrease under carbon limitation too. And so on and so forth and go on. We, we, we can identify something like six clusters, and each one has a, a simple behavior. Okay, so the basic picture is just as predicted by the theory. That is, uh, if you apply some limitation, there's one department that's responsible for this limitation. They increase, do the rest decrease, but the change is in, in a way that's linear with growth rate, so everything can be predicted. <coughs> All right. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to uh, skip this. The, so now, so we have all this uh, simple uh, dependence on growth rate, right? So we ask, how does the cell know to organize according to growth rate? Right? So this, this, this does not just, uh, so, so this, okay, it is, uh, it is a sort of a, uh, requires some kind of a coordination, right? So, so because the, at the molecular level, the cells are con telling these proteins to increase under this condition, to decrease under that condition. So, so how does it know? Right? How does it know how fast is a, a cell growing? Right? If, you're a bag of pro no, this, if you think of a cell as a bag of proteins, how does a bag of proteins know how fast the bag is growing? Right? It, it, it apparently knows because it's controlling uh, things very well. All right, so let's uh, have a, so, so here I present a coarse grain view of uh, the, the flux, uh, well, the, the, the simple behaviors through the um, <coughs> of the biosynthesis. You have nutrient from the outside, they're being taken up, okay, and they're converted into these metabolites, amino acids, ATPs, and all that. Then these metabolites being stitched together uh, through the polymerization reaction by ribosome to make proteins, okay? So that's basically w what's happening during the growth process. And um, so this is done by the enzyme, right? So the, the flux through it is proportional to the enzyme concentration. Uh, the, the translation, uh, how, much, uh, how much protein production is being made is proportional to ribosome. The coefficient is how uh, fast these enzymes work. And in particular, I want to, uh, to focus on uh, this coefficient here, which is basically the average translation speed of the ribosome. So <coughs> of the protein that's being made, some are the enzymes that take, it, take up more nutrients, the, the C proteins. Some are the enzymes that, well, these are ribosomes themselves. And uh, you can see there's a loop here, ribosome make ribosome. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, the basically the self-catalytic step that determines the growth. How much ribosome making ribosome? Because that's the bottleneck of a cell growth. All right, and then regulation of a ribosome, how much ribosome to make, is the key control point for this uh, uh, rapid growing system of, uh, that determines how fast cell growth. So how is this regulation done? Well, at a qualitative level, biologists know that this regulation listens to the amount of uh, these metabolites in the cell. So there's a way to survey the metabolites in the cell. And the basic idea is that 
if I have lots of uh, metabolites, I have lots of substrate, then I make more of a machine that consume, uh, consume this substrate. Makes sense, right? If, if I don't have much substrate, then I, I, I decrease the production. Qualitatively, it uh, goes very well. Okay, uh, a bit of a detail. This positive link is done uh, through a double negative process, right? It is the uncharged tRNA, which is a, uncharged tRNA increases when there's a lack of a metabolite, right? And then, then the uncharged tRNA produces, uh, uh, the, there's a protein that monitors uncharged tRNA and produces the signal called PPGPP, magic spot, which then inhibits ribosome synthesis. Now we're getting to nitty gritty of uh, the, the signal. Um, the, the there's a one problem. So qualitatively, that's all fine. Quantitatively, there's one problem. Because all of these things, any one missing will affect translation, or will affect cell growth. Right? You, have, you need 20 amino acids to make protein. I just have one amino acid lacking, and you're stuck, you cannot grow. So this magic, there's a piece of magic here, right, that somehow it needs to integrate all of these variables. You need to lis listen to each of these variables and determine how much to uh, output, uh, to get the signal of how many ribosomes you make. Right? So just remind you that all of this stuff, right, it, you need to <laughs> keep track of it. Any one of these reactions not working, you're not making sense. Right? So here's those pointers say that this is a problem not only difficult for for as physicists, biologists uh, trying to understand the cell, but it's, it's, a, it's a challenge for the cell itself. Right? Which, wh where do you pay your attention to? Well, so, right, so, so the, the essence of the problem is, uh, yeah, how, how does the cell know how fast it's growing? What does it listen to? So we made a guess, okay? and the guess was that instead of listening to all of these variables, the cell maybe is just listening to how fast the ribosomes are working. Okay, so so what that means is that instead of a, a, a direct link from these metabolites to this uh, signal, okay, the signal is actually coming from uh, this translation speed, which itself depends on all of these metabolites. Right, so essentially in, in mathematics, uh, this is how we would write it. And uh, this is, uh, so remind you, this is uh, basically the trick we had, the simplification trick in structural mechanics. <coughs> All right, so if you accept this as an ansatz, then you can very easily derive a, a close relation uh, for the system. You can write down the production of uh, each of these enzymes uh, uh, through this uh, control function and uh, their degradation through the, uh, their, their dilution through uh, uh, cell growth. And then you can, from the level of this enzyme, you can determine the, the elongation rate just by setting these two flux to each, uh, equal to each other. Then you get this, just a closed equation for this uh, variable, All right? Now it requires two uh, functions, regulatory functions, but these we, we know their form because we already know the steady state behavior. So this, this is uh, supposed to work during the kinetic, during the, it, it's for, for all times, uh, including steady state. Okay, in a steady state we already have these growth laws. So, so these, these functions we can recover from growth law and they look something like that. So anyway, so then this system you can integrate and just solve in closed form. Okay, these, these laws are very simple, just transform a uh, version of an uh, inverse relation. And uh, then from the solution we can uh, describe uh, all of this uh, kinetics. And that was the result I was showing you at the beginning. Okay, and nothing goes into it except for steady state behavior, uh, the, the, this linear growth law. Right, <coughs> up shift, going up faster and, and slowing down. And we further look into actually the content, so look at the proteomes, not just look at the, the cell density of your uh, reporter. And uh, the, for, for the different sectors of protein, they're also working just as we would predict uh, by the model. Okay. <coughs> so, and, and this is, uh, we, we did this not just for this one type of growth, we look at the, the several dozens of growth, they all, they all work. All right, so back to this overall picture. What we have, what we're saying is that the cell is uh, determining how fast it's going by monitoring the translation activity. Okay, and G here is this PPGPP, right? So is this the case? So actually then after we established phenomenology, we went back to directly look at this, okay? 
and we look at one of these transitions. And uh, so during this recovery of this transition, we measure the elongation rate. Uh, that's, the, that's the purple symbol, that's direct measurement. And we measure this PPDDP, which is a blue symbol. We make a correlation with each other, simple linear learning. Okay, so during, that's during cleanse. So that was predicted, and then we you know, indeed <coughs> uh, recovered that. All right, so cell is doing this uh, through, uh, yeah, so it's monitoring, integrating all this variable just by look, listening to elongation. Oh, time is a little over. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so, so I, 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 I'm just the last piece of, a, uh, of detail is one can then make a, a molecular model of a how, how, where, where this linear relation come from. Uh, so this is inverse of translation speed, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that. So there's a, even a molecular implementation through how protein work with ribosome synthesis. But only for the Apache Nados, we can return to this point. All right, so what I've described here is a mode of a regulation that, is, that depends on activity. Okay. This is counter to typical sort of uh, schema regulation uh, uh, biologists, biochemists think about uh, operating in living cells. Okay, so because bio chemistry works by concentration, right? So you have, a, you have two things, they interact, and it depends on concentration. So you intuitively, you think about concentration dependent things for regulation. And, but then, and so there are two types of uh, regulation that, uh, that, that is um, uh, very, uh, popularly uh, known in biology. One is called end product inhibition. That is, uh, that you, want to tr you want to try to regulate a, a flux, and if you see too much end product accumulating, then you, you, you send a signal go back to, okay, uh, slow down uh, the, 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 uh, the process, right? end product inhibition. Another is the sort of, a, I would say, supply-driven uh, kind of activation. That is, if you have a lot of uh, substrate accumulating, then you make more of the processes to consume. Okay, so these are two a very well-known type of regulation. But there's a problem with uh, any concentration-dependent scheme of regulation, and that goes back to the problem of a parameter explosion. Every time you have a concentration-dependent scheme of regulation, you have to deal with parameters. You have to so concentration of this, concentration of that, right? <coughs> and so, and then once you get to this route, then we're stuck in the thinking about concentration, you have to measure everything. So, um, although concentration is the sort of default variable every biology biochemist think about over what happens in a cell, I argue that it is, it, is a, it is a trap. This is almost the same trap as if you would think about a gas in a room by thinking about molecular trajectory. It is a natural variable to do if you think as a, from a Newtonian mechanics, but once you do that, you need to know all the parameters, right? But instead, the cell in this case seemed to do not by looking at concentration, but look at processes. This is sort of the, the, one of the, uh, the meta lessons we learn from this. Um, so finally, an analogy to uh, bring home, that is uh, suppose you're running a big factory that makes a lot of uh, many, many different things, right? You're taking lots of inputs and uh, shipping out lots of uh, product. How do you decide how many workers to hire? Right? You, could, you could do an inventory, keep track of uh, you know, every, Product, right, and see which workers work on which product, right? Uh, and same with the inventory, that's a lot of work. Um, e. coli, uh, the strategy I, I told you about is not doing that. Right? It's doing something very simple. It is just counting how many workers are idle. Okay? If you see a lot of people taking break all the time, you can get rid of some, your factory is still fine. <laughs> if nobody's sleeping, you better hire some more workers. Okay, that, that's, that's all it's doing. So it does not need to know about detail. It can control things for you. Use it or lose it. <laughs> okay? All right, so finally, I uh, just bring the context that I told you a very simple, small problem in uh, biology, right? But of course, the real goal is to study something much more complicated. And uh, uh, the hope is that by not forgetting about the, uh, the, the macroscopic behavior, maybe that would inject, uh, uh, maybe uh, suggest some way of thinking about uh, how to put the microscopics together to, to understand the system. <coughs> so uh, this work was done uh, with, uh, so what I mainly talked about 
so there was the work done in the past. Uh, over the, this is the work accumulated over 10 years. There are many people being involved uh, in this work. Um, starting the first paper on this was 10 years ago with uh, Matt Scott and Stefan Krum. Um, so the work on growth transition was done with Eric Davison, a, 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 a physics uh, student, and a Severin Shrink, a, a visiting uh, exchange student, also uh, coming from physics. And uh, on this uh, PPG signaling was done with the biochemist, uh, Rohan, and together with the physics graduate students. Right? And, all of, and the, uh, the business of our lab is trying to make quantitative predictive understanding of living system, as simple as it may be. A growing bacteria is a living system. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.